This is a lecture on digital signatures and identification for COMP 375 Computer Architecture and Organization at North Carolina A&T State University. This is the last lecture on content. Uh, we'll have a review for the final exam. The final exam is scheduled for Thursday, May 7th, from 8 to 10 a.m. This is the end. This is the last course content. There will be a review lecture. Please be sure to do the course evaluations for all of your classes. Digital signatures can be used to identify something as your own. Its concept is to be similar to a handwritten signature. You want it difficult to forge. You want somebody to be easily checked that it is in fact you. Non-denial, non-repudiation, that once you sign something, you can't deny that you did it. Of course, it should be easy to implement and it should be different from document to document, something that you can't just copy from one document to another. A message hash is like a checksum. A checksum is where you just add all the bytes together and get a sum. If you change the bytes, the sum is different. But a checksum is typically more complex than that. There are several standard uh, checksum or hash systems. SHA1, the standard hash algorithm, is one common method for producing a hash from all the values. They're known to be one-way functions. That is, it's easy to compute the hash value for a given document. But so far, nobody knows how to create a document that will produce a given hash value. Digital signatures are a way of signing a document or plain text, be it text, a file, or anything, so that you can verify who created it. The RSA asymmetric or public key encryption can be used uh, to encrypt or decrypt. That is, with RSA, you have a public key and a private key. Either key can be used to encrypt, and you just use the other key to decrypt. Here's the process for creating a digital signature. Let's look at the picture. You start with some plain text, and again, plain text can be text, a document, a file, a picture, anything. Bits are bits, whatever they are, just go through this process. You then create the one-way hash, uh, and that creates a, a usually a SHA-1 160 bits or 20 bytes worth of hash material. You then encrypt the hash, not only the hash, not the document, but the public key using the public key. And then you append that to the document, and you can either send it across the network or store it on a disk. And then the receiver gets that a document with the appended signature, removes the appended signature, uses the same one-way hash as previously on the document, and creates the uh, condensed bits, and then compares the condensed bits that were received in the document after they decrypt with the user's public key with the ones they created. In other words, if they decrypt them and you get the same value that you created, then you can assume that the document has not been changed. If, though, the bits are different, then either the document has been changed along the way or it was not created by the person who claims it was created. The answer is A, identifies the creator of the file. You can still read the document and, of course, you generally cannot see the digital signature. Digital signatures can be used in several ways. You can use them for email to verify who sent the email. Frequently on the web, uh, programs that you download are digitally signed so that you can be assured they came from the manufacturer who claims they made them and they have not been modified or no viruses or malware has been attached to them. Digitally signed programs cannot be affected because the infection will be detected by the digital signature. The great summary email that Lord Dr. Williams sent to you was digitally signed. 
You can check his details of his digital signature if your email system will allow. In order for digital signatures and public key encryption to work, you have to have a means of giving people the public keys. There are two basic ways to do this. One is to have key servers, so that you can ask a key server for somebody's public key, or you can use digital certificates, which are the most common method. Key servers are pretty simple. You simply send a request to the key server, which has a big database. It looks up the public key of the user you're interested in, and it sends it back to you. They use the key server's digital signature so that the messages to and from the key server are digitally signed. Therefore, you know you're getting the correct result from the true key server. Digital signatures contain the user's public key along with some information about the user, typically their email address, name, uh, organization they're connected with. The digital signature is then digitally signed by a certificate authority. Certificate authorities are vendors or organizations that generally sell dig digital certificates. Uh, your email client must know the public key of the certificate authority. In Microsoft Windows, if you go out and look at your browser, you can usually see the cache of all the digital certificates and digital authorities that your email system knows. Here's how they work. Uh, on the right, we have the user's data or the data that you want to digitally sign. We then make a checksum of that digital sign and you encrypt that checksum with Alice's private key. We're going to assume that Alice is sending a message to Bob because Alice always sends messages to Bob in any encryption system that you ever see. So this checksum is encrypted with Alice's private key. And then we provide Alice's public key so that you can decrypt it. Well, how do you really know this is Alice's public key? Because the public key has got a checksum. We include the checksum of the public key. And that checksum of the Alice's public key has been encrypted with the private key of the certificate authority. If you have the public key of the certificate authority, then you can decrypt the checksum. Compute the checksum of Alice's public key and see if it matches the, what you have decrypted. If it does, you can be pretty well assured that this is the correct public key for Alice. You can then uh, make a hash of the data yourself and then decrypt the checksum you receive with Alice's public key and see if they match. If you do, you're pretty well assured that the information actually came from Alice. The answer is C. The certificate contains the public key of the sender. Here's an example of how you might use uh, certificates in an organization. We just use a university because we're all familiar with universities. Uh, imagine the uh, chancellor has a, a private key and a public key. And he can create a public key for all the deans. And it's each of the deans has a public key. And it's given to them by the chancellor because the chancellor knows who the deans are. And each public key is digitally signed by the chancellor. The chancellor can then, uh, or the, the deans can then create public keys for the chairs and sign them by the ch dean's uh, public key, and or private key. And then uh, the chairs can give them out to the faculty members. And so now uh, you have a chain of trust. You have the chancellor verifying the deans, the deans verifying the chairs, and the chairs can verify the faculty. Uh, so all you really need is to start is the public key of the chancellor, and then you can go down the list and decrypt each one and validate that the email is in fact correctly from a faculty member. Let's think about how to authenticate yourself to any uh, web system or program that wants to make sure that you are really you. There are several ways to do it. They're based on what do you know, such as passwords, what do you have, such as a identification card, where you are, what location are you located, what you are, biometrics, and what you can do. People pick miserable passwords. Be sure to always use unique long passwords with different characters. 
Two-factor authentication is becoming very common. Two-factor authentication requires you to use two or more authentication modes. Commonly, this is you type in a password and then the system will text you a code on your phone and then you type in the code. That way, you have to prove that something you know is the password and something you have is your phone. Most systems require a user ID and password to log in, which is probably the least secure system we can possibly use because users typically pick very poor passwords. For PIN numbers, where the passwords are uh, numerical, one, two, three, four, five, six is very common. In fact, the top most 10 most common uh, PIN numbers accounts for 50% of all the PINs used. So if you're going to guess PIN numbers, you just guess the top 10, you have a 50-50 chance of getting into most systems. Security or authentication by what you have uh, can be done many ways. ID cards are common, uh, smart cards, or some sort of USB inserted device. You plug it into your system and it knows, ah, this is you. Uh, again, it can be used with other authentication modes. At a location where I used to work, I would have to slide my ID card and type in a number on the door in order to get inside. Your physical location can be used to validate whether this is likely to be you. Frequently, you'll see systems want to know, should I remember this computer? They are remembering the IP address of your computer. So if you use that same IP address later, it has some uh, clue that this is actually you. If you come from someplace else, you may not know. Also, for systems that have uh, global positioning systems, GPS, such as your phone, it might just decide uh, to check the GPS, and if you are in your, where you should be, you know, if you're not someplace in Timbuktu, then it may decide it will allow you. Otherwise, it may prohibit your access. Uh, sometimes systems require you to be uh, on campus. At a and uh, there are certain administrative systems that you can only use on campus that you cannot access from on campus. Oh. What you can do, there are mechanical tasks that people can repeat that tend to be somewhat individual. The most common one is typing your name. When you type your name, you've done it so often that uh, you type it at a particular speed. If you carefully measure the speed between each keystroke uh, and then measure somebody else doing it, even though they may know how to type your name, they probably won't type it with the same inner key timings. And so you can get a relatively statistical likelihood that the person is in fact who they claim to be or not. You can kind of divide the different biometrics into different orders. Here's many different ways to measure or evaluate is this person who they truly say they are. Again, the behavioral, as I said, keystrokes or actual written signatures or voice interpretation. Uh, actual physiological measurements, uh, there's fingerprints, hand measurements, measurements of the iris, uh, facial recognition, and then measurements of DNA. Fingerprint readers are relatively simple and inexpensive. I've had one on my computer for many years. Uh, for most people, they're pretty reliable, although some people have fingerprints that don't show very well and they are not very effective for fingerprint readers. Remember, your finger doesn't have to be attached to your hand. Uh, the iris portion of your eye is said to be unique for every person. So if you can get a close-up picture of the iris and match it up for to other people, you can tell if this person is likely to be the person who they claim to be. This works much better for authentication than uh, recognition. If somebody finds out your password, you can easily change your password. If somebody gets a copy of your fingerprints or whatever other biometric, it can be very hard to change. And of course, what if that particular biometric is unavailable? There are a bunch of different uh, 
attacks that people can make against systems. Some of those common ones are Trojan horses. A Trojan horse is when somebody puts some sort of functionality in a program that does something that you didn't expect it to do, usually something malicious. In other words, the people who wrote the program intentionally put this uh, Trojan horse inside the software. A worm is self-replicating software. That is, it's uh, when you run it, it copies itself out on other computers, other files. A virus is also self-replicating and it attaches itself or modifies other programs that it can access in your system. Malicious software uh, is a program and therefore can only attack a system if you execute it. So if you have uh, malicious software in, say, a plain text file, you don't execute text files so it can't attack your system. Only five, only one, two, three, four, five students have completed the evaluation for Comp 375. Please complete the eva course evaluation for all your classes.